500 years ago, it is said two young princes, one heir to the throne of England, were murdered in the Tower of London. Their uncle, Richard III, the last English king to personally lead troops into battle, was accused. Others hold this to be slander. Richard, they say, was a most valiant, most virtuous king. Which was true? Was Richard the murderous villain of Shakespeare's imagination? Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. Did Richard have his nephews murdered to gain the crown? The answer to this mystery may yet be found in the Tower of London. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Beside the Thames River flowing through the city of London stand the grim stone walls of the Tower of London. the ruins of an ancient Roman fortress, William the Conqueror ordered construction of a huge castle in the year 1078. It would dominate the landscape and intimidate the local inhabitants. Over the centuries, subsequent kings made it one of the strongest fortifications in all of Europe. It has withstood siege, bombardment, and the Great Fire that destroyed London. For 900 years it has served as a fortress, a royal palace, a dreaded prison, and a treasury for the crown jewels. The crown of England, the pinnacle of power. It cost the lives of many ambitious noblemen. The quest of it dimmed honor and loyalty. Richard III was accused of such an obsession. His adversary, Henry Tudor, burned with the same desire. Peter Hammond, Tower Historian. I think what most people know about the Tower is the time when it was a state prison, a place where important political prisoners were kept. There were many famous people in the Tower, and most of them came to unfortunate ends beheaded or disappearing mysteriously. Prisoners were often brought to the tower by riverboat. The fate of many to have their heads impaled on the spikes of Tower Bridge. Few who arrived here ever left. Stairways led to secret passages and torture chambers deep within the walls, where terrible screams were often heard. Beneath these stones, the earth was once soaked with the blood of queens. Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, wives of Henry VIII. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote his history of the world during his 12-year imprisonment here, before he too was beheaded. One sad tale is that of Lady Jane Grey. Guiltless herself, but a victim of her family's ambition. She was executed after being queen for just nine days. One of the most interesting, fascinating mysteries in the tower is what happened to the two young princes. Those two royal children, the sons of Edward IV, who disappeared mysteriously after the elder one lost the crown that was his by right and his uncle Richard III became king and said. What we know about it uh, is not very much. We know that the princes were in the tower, 
after their uncle Richard became king. We know that they were last seen in the tower. We know that uh, a couple of hundred years later, the bones of two young children were found, who may or may not have been the princes. In writing, we have stories about rumours of the princes having died, but nothing more than that. There is only one recorded fact concerning the young princes entered into the records of the day, that they were last seen in June 1483, playing at bows and arrows in the tower yard. They were never seen again. The popular story has it that Richard plotted with one Sir James Tyrrell to murder the princes. Not content with being the young king's lord protector, he wanted the throne himself. The opportunity came, it is said, when young Edward, heir to the crown, was placed in the tower according to the tradition that all kings to be must reside there before their coronation. His young brother was brought to keep him company. Sir James obtained the keys to the tower and one midnight, accompanied by two henchmen, secretly came to the place where the boys slept. Tiro kept watch at the door. The accomplices entered the chamber. the story is true or not, the children were never seen again. Their uncle Richard is believed by many to be completely innocent. One group, the Richard III Society in London, has thousands of members in branches throughout the world. Their spokesman is Jeremy Potter. Richard III is probably the most maligned character in history. Uh, he reigned only for two years as King of England, and he's been dead for nearly 500. His reputation has been blackened uh, by the myths that were put out by the Tudors, who took the throne from him. He was the last of the Plantagenet kings. He was the rightful King of England. He was a good king. He was a better man than most, so far as we can judge his character at this distance of time. Well, he was obviously an extremely courageous and extremely generous, I would say, an extremely straightforward person. He did care about the uh, less privileged of his subjects. There would be no good reason for Richard wanting to kill the boys. When Edward IV, the boy's father, died, he left uh, Richard uh, as Lord Protector of the realm and of the elder boy, and the country did not wish for a boy king. So Richard III was the adult heir to the Plantagenet throne. He was accepted by the City of London, by the Houses of Parliament, as the rightful king. Richard would have gained nothing out of the, the murder of the princes without anybody being certain that they were dead. Uh, I think he was a, an ambitious man, and at this time he was a frightened man. Um, and one can see perhaps everything he did, and perhaps the murder of the princes as well, as things that he did to save himself, to preserve himself from his enemies. He had to make himself king because that was the only way he was safe from the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, and her family, who were after his life, in fact, as he knew. It was a battle to the death between them. And once the princes were in the tower, it wasn't safe even to leave them alive because their names could be used by any rebels or conspirators against Richard as indeed was to happen. So, to preserve himself, I think he had them done away with. At 
Westminster Abbey, head librarian Howard Nixon added his view. The evidence of Richard III's complicity was based almost entirely on Sir Thomas More's uh, history of the reign of King Richard III, in which he was quite convinced that Richard was a double-dyed villain and that he was entirely responsible for the murder of the princes. But Sir Thomas More was a very biased witness because he was in the service of Cardinal Morton, one of Richard III's greatest enemies. And although in his account More writes as if he was personally present when this story uh, was being unfolded, in fact he was a boy uh, probably under six years old. William Shakespeare, enlarging on Sir Thomas More's story, went even further in perpetuating the image of an evil Richard. Actor Robert O'Mahony. The part of uh, Shakespeare's Richard III has always been incredibly popular with actors. David Garrick made his reputation with it. Edmund Keane, one of his favorite roles. Irving, Olivier. And whatever people actually think was the true nature of the historical Richard. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of this image of him as the bottled spider, as the Red King, as the evil, evil monster. Shakespeare was a writer of fiction. He was a writer of historical fiction. And he made up the plots in order to suit his particular characters. And of course he based them on some historical facts, but uh, he accepted the Tudor version of Richard III because there was very strict censorship at the time and if he had not his play would never have been performed and he would have been thrown into prison. Not content with creating one of the most villainous characters in literature, Shakespeare makes Richard deformed physically. He gives him a hump, he gives him a withered arm. Shakespeare makes Richard lay bare his character, his motives and his intentions in the very opening speech of the play when he turns to the audience and he says, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this sun of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in his lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a loop. I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable, the dogs bark at me as I halt by them. The medieval mind thought that a deformed body indicated an evil person, a deformed mind. It was to the interests of the tutors to suggest that he was a villain, and they therefore made up a physical deformity in order to back this case. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days. I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous. This day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. This was, this was entirely invented after uh, his death, and also the story about the withered arm. Well, now, how on earth could a man uh, with a withered arm ride a horse and wield a, a battle axe? Barely two years after gaining the crown, Richard was forced to fight to keep it. Henry Tudor exiled in France, landed on English soil and raised an army to lay claim to the English throne. 
Richard's forces met the Tudors in the field at Bosworth. At a critical moment, Richard, famous strategist in battle, the fighting lord of the north, made his decision. He spurred his horse and charged headlong into the midst of his enemies. Battle of Bosworth to save his crown, Richard III thundered into the midst of his enemies seeking to bring down his adversary, Henry Tudor. But one of Richard's closest allies, Lord Stanley, defecting at the last moment, intercepted Richard within sight of his goal. Not even Richard's enemies ever claimed that he lacked courage or skill in battle. But treachery within his own ranks brought him down. If Richard had killed to gain the crown, now it was all for nothing. In the two years of his short reign, he had lost his much beloved son, his wife, and now his kingdom and his life. His last cry was treason. On Richard's death, Henry Tudor became king, and a strange silence fell regarding the fate of the princes. Twenty years later, Henry ordered the execution of Sir James Tyrrell for treason. Afterwards, he even waited a further two months, then suddenly said that Tyrrell had confessed to the murder of the princes at Richard's command. Although there's no evidence of such a confession, it became the source for the stories of Richard's guilt. But if Richard was not guilty, who was? Henry VII had very good reason to have the princes murdered because he'd become king by battle, by beating Richard at Bodsworth. His claim to the throne wasn't very good and the princes had a better claim. So Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII, may well have found the boys alive and murdered them himself. He did have other people who were in the royal line um, put out of the way in the tower, imprisoned or even executed on trumped up charges. The only thing that makes me think that perhaps he was innocent is that uh, maybe the princes weren't alive for him to have them murdered when he came to the throne. Before you have a murderer, you have to have a murder. And there is no evidence that the princes were murdered. They may have been. They simply disappeared. And so the story rested for almost 200 years. Then in 1547, some workmen found what appeared to be the bones of two children under a stairway at the base of the tower. Believing them to be the remains of the princes, King Charles I had them sealed in an urn and placed in Westminster Abbey. Ironically, in the chapel of Henry VII, who might well have been their murderer. Nearly two centuries later, in 1933, the urn was opened and the bones were examined by experts. We've got some pictures of the bones here and um, there is the almost complete skull of the elder child 
and this shows the rather more broken one of the younger boy. Here are the thigh bones of the two children and you can see that one is longer than the other and the jawbone of Edward VI. The, the examination of those bones in the Abbey nearly 50 years ago proved nothing. It didn't prove the sex of the children, they could be female. It didn't prove the century uh, with which they lived and it didn't prove their age. And uh, I hope that there will be another and more scientific investigation. Certainly we are pressing the Dean and Chapter to have them re-examined. Once somebody has been buried in the Abbey, been given Christian burial, um, they are in a slightly different position from bones preserved in a museum. And you cannot keep on poking into bones that have been given Christian burial inside a church. I think they're reluctant to re-examine them because they're reluctant to disturb royal tombs, but the whole question here is whether they are royal tombs. Are the bones in the abbey those of the princes? Were the princes murdered at all? If so, is Henry VII, who gained and kept the crown, responsible for their deaths? Is Richard the most maligned king in history, or truly Shakespeare's arch-villain? Perhaps new dating methods, or a forgotten scroll in some dusty library, may eventually give the answer to this intriguing mystery of the Tower of London. The warders at the Tower say that sometimes, in the early dawn, the figures of two small, lost boys walk anxiously, hand in hand, on the Tower Green. Are these the princes, and for whom do they search? <laughs>